when we provided niacin to those cows, the acute phase proteins that would suggest a general systemic inflammation were blunted by about 30% when we provided niacin to the cow. And we were excited by that, but a little bit concerned because you don't necessarily want to stop an immune response to mastitis. We just don't want it to get out of control. So what was really interesting is even though the systemic inflammatory markers were reduced, we saw a similar local response when we think about the number of somatic cells in the, in the udder. everyone, this is Luis Ferreiro, one of the hosts of the Dairy Nutrition Black Belt podcast. And today we have opportunity to talk about niacin with Dr. Kirby Krogstad, assistant professor at The Ohio State University. First, thank you, Kirby, for joining us for this episode. We really appreciate you uh, taking the time to discuss this important topic with us. But before we jump into it, can you please give us a brief background about yourself? Yeah, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. And I like taking the time to talk about some of the work that, that I've been a part of. So as you said, I'm, I'm down here at the Ohio State University. I'm actually at the Worcester campus, which is about an hour and a half from Columbus, for those who don't know. And my role here is uh, dairy nutrition and dairy health. So I have a 70% research appointment, 30% extension. So I spend a lot of my time, time thinking about how to use uh, nutrition or specific nutrients as a tool to improve animal performance and animal health. And hopefully, as we discuss, you'll hear how niacin might be part of that equation for some of our producers. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's a great model. You know, the more we can use nutrition to optimize the dairy herd, I think the best for us, especially job security, right? So, uh, <laughs> but, jo but jokes aside, tell us more about what does niacin do for the dairy cow? Yeah, so that's an excellent question. I think niacin is part of the B vitamin complex. You know, there's a handful of B vitamins that, that we really talk about in, in human health and monogastric nutrition, but we don't talk about them as much in dairy nutrition. And that's because the rumen is providing all those B vitamins to the cow, or at least we think is providing all those B vitamins that the cow needs. Niacin specifically is um, a precursor to one of those molecules in the electron transport chain and the Krebs cycle that we've probably learned and forgotten 10 million times. So it's the NAD and NADH and NADP and NADPH molecules that niacin serves as a precursor for those which then drive energy metabolism. There are a few other functions that we're just starting to learn about, but that's kind of the classic one that, um, that we would be providing niacin for. And when it comes to the ruminant animal, obviously, we, we have to be always aware and sometimes worried about the rumen, right? Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, a lot of the nutrients will be uh, digested or sometimes partially digested by uh, microorganisms there. So based on that, does niacin has to be rumen protected in order to be fed to dairy cows? Yeah, another excellent question. I mean, the the hard part is B vitamins are differentially degraded through the rumen. And so niacin is one of the B vitamins that is quite extensively degraded. Some of the data um, suggests, you know, up to like 95, 99% of it, if you fed it raw or unprotected, would be degraded by the rumen microbes. And so feeding it, you're really feeding it in that form. You're not going to see much getting past the rumen into the small intestine where then you might see any beneficial effects. So niacin, to deliver it effectively, in a decent or reasonable dose certainly has to be rumen protected for um, for that dairy cow. Assuming we do our jobs with a good rumen protected source of niacin, how does that affect the immune function or what are the different roles that niacin can play related to that? Yeah, this is where um, I spent most of my time in my PhD with Dr. Bradford thinking about, and we just published some work on this. So one of the roles of niacin that I we wanted to expand upon is that it has some immune modulatory functions that we've seen in humans and mice and in other species. And uh, what it actually does is it, it binds to a cell surface receptor that's present on a whole host of cells. It's present in adipose. It's present on immune cells. It's um, present in the brain. And, and so it's, it's present in a lot of places. But on the immune cell, it'll bind to this receptor called the HCAR2. And when it binds to that receptor, it, it, uh, there's evidence that it causes a downregulation in a lot of immune function, um, or I should say a downregulation in um, pathologic immune function, like secretion of really intense cytokines and uh, signaling to increase phagocytosis and some of these damaging effects of immune cells. And so our thought was, can we feed niacin, cause that um, 
reaction or that binding to that cell surface receptor to modulate the immune response. And we conducted an experiment with really late lactation cows. So that's a big caveat is I think we all understand now that stage of lactation really dictates responses to a whole host of nutrients and niacin would be no different. So the experiment we did, these cows were 280 days in milk, body condition score four. I mean, they, they were hefty. And what we did is we fed them niacin or not, and we challenged them with mastitis using LPS, which is just simulates a, a short, intense E. coli mastitis. And we measured a series of acute phase proteins to look at inflammatory markers. And we also looked at somatic cell, cell count in the udder. What I thought was really interesting, what we saw is that when we provided niacin to those cows, the acute phase proteins that would suggest a general systemic inflammation were blunted by about 30% when we provided niacin to the cow. And we were excited by that, but a little bit concerned because you don't necessarily want to stop an immune response to mastitis. We just don't want it to get out of control. So what was really interesting is even though the systemic inflammatory markers were reduced, we saw a similar local response when we think about the number of somatic cells in the in the udder. So whether they got niacin or not, they had the same amount of somatic cells in the udder, but then on a systemic level, based on those acute phase proteins, we seem to have a blunted response. And so it was a really intriguing data set and, and an encouraging one for us that we think it could be a tool to help modulate or control that animal's response to some of those stressors. No, and I think that fits very well with some of the other work that we are aware of with niacin, right? That are work that suggests even a good response against uh, heat stress, for example, right, which obviously uh, is probably not as bad in terms of immune function compared to uh, mastitis, depending on where you are, of course, for Wisconsin, I'm assuming, right? Uh, so definitely, I think it has a lot of uh, application there from that perspective. But you mentioned a little bit about the immune function and how does niacin helps with that. How about performance? Are there any facts that we should expect when we offer rumen protected niacin to dairy cows? As you said, there's a lot of previous research in niacin. One of the challenges digging into a lot of that is they were smaller scale experiments and under very particular circumstances, like you mentioned, heat stress, or in my case, mastitis challenges. So in those cases, it's hard to discern some of those performance differences. So with that late lactation study I just mentioned that's published and out in press in Journal of Dairy Science, uh, we didn't see a performance difference uh, from providing room protected niacin. Now, we did do a follow-up experiment on a Michigan dairy herd um, where we enrolled 1,100 cows is what it came out to be, I think. And now about half of them got niacin, about half of them didn't. <clears throat> and this should be coming out in press very soon. But we saw that the cows that got niacin had um, about a kilo, kilo and a half more milk at peak than the cows who didn't. And we only provided niacin to those cows after calving for two or three weeks. So it's it's um, there's some promise there. But as I mentioned a few minutes ago, the timing of you know, stage of lactation, the timing of that supplementation window are probably quite important because if we couple the response we saw in our data with some previous data out of Kansas State and University of Wisconsin-Madison, if we provide niacin before calving and after calving, there is no milk yield response in those first three or four weeks. But when we provided it only after calving, we did see a yield response that was most pronounced at peak. So by, you know, 70, 80, 90 days in milk, we didn't notice it in that first two or three weeks. So I think we have a lot to learn with niacin and a lot of other B vitamins and feed additives about that timing of supplementation, the magnitude of that response and the timing of the response. It may not show up right away. It may wait until peak lactation or even the lactation curve shape might shift. Introducing Ultrasorb R3.0, Volac's comprehensive and complete solution to reduce the negative impact of naturally occurring toxins on ruminants. Ultrasorb R3.0 is a species-specific product designed to mitigate the effects of specific mycotoxins in the gastrointestinal tract of ruminants. Ultrasorb R3.0 also offers lipopolysaccharides binding capabilities. Endotoxins such as LPS can contribute to inflammation in ruminants with energy partitioned to mount an immune response instead of production. Learn more about Ultrasorb R3.0 at volac.com. No, I highly agree with you. And and obviously, right, even though it's uh, a recent study, uh, this this increase in milk production is quite considerable. So certainly it looks like uh, there is very good advantage in offering uh, rumen protect niacin in early lactation. Uh, so definitely something that the dairy nutritionist should be aware of 
uh, aware of and pay close attention to. So do you think that this effect is related to what you describe about immune function, or you think that there is something else related to that? I think there is something else because we did try to look at some of those same inflammatory related proteins in the second follow-up project, and that was not changed by the niacin provision. So I, I think there's something else there. There is some other data in mice and people that would suggest there's something else going on, but something I certainly hope to dig into um, in the coming months and years. Yeah, well, I'm really looking forward to any of the research that you conduct in this area moving forward. Thank you. Uh, thank you again for joining us. Thank you at home for joining us today. And you see also a link for the paper uh, that Kirby mentioned below the like button. So make sure first you go there, you like, and then you download the paper and go through that to learn more about that. Thank you very much. Hey, everyone. We are always searching for the latest and greatest research to share weekly. If you have a dairy nutrition related research trial and would like to come on the show and share it with us, feel free to email the details of your research to hello at wisenetics.com. Thank you and hope to see you soon.